morning. This Sunday is the second Sunday after Pentecost, and uh, graciously, Reverend Lance has agreed to fill in for John Corbier, who is exposed to COVID. So COVID is still going around. So it's the last minute. We want to thank you. We begin with the opening hymn, 376, all verses, 376. Again, on page 79, page 79. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves, and on behalf of others, those things that are necessary for our life, and our salvation, and so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed of what we have done, of what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of our son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Page 80. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him.
Jubilate. Our responsorial today is from chapter 50 of the book of Psalms. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will bear witness against you, for I am God, your God. You know? I will take no bull calf from your stalls, nor he goats out of your pens. I know every bird in the sky and the creatures of the fields are in my sight. Do you think I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall honor me. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from chapter 5 of the book of Hosea. Thus says the Lord, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, they will beg my favor. Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn, and he will heal us. He has struck down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains the water, rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Look, your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have killed them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. The word of the Lord. Benedictus.
Our New Testament reading this morning is from chapter 4 of St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom we, he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Our sequence hymn is hymn 470, all verses, 470, all verses.
A reading from the, uh, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If only I touch the cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up, and the report of this spread throughout the district. Here ends the reading. Words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got to be honest. I've debated a lot about the question of whether one can pray and legitimately expect that a healing might take place. Particularly now when, as most of you know, my wonderful wife Anne, who was many times a chalice bearer here at St. John's, as well as a member of the Altar Guild, and most recently a member of the Vestry, has had a most dire disease descend upon her, progressive supranuclear palsy, which has no treatment, let alone cure. I've certainly known others who have had similarly dreadful and depressing diagnoses. Seeing them at the end succumb to their diseases has made me pretty ambivalent about what prayer can accomplish even though on a few occasions I've actually seen what seemed to be miraculous cures uh, occur. Most of the time, though, folks I've known have not had their health restored, despite the fervent prayers of family and friends. I once told you some time ago about my friend Marty, who, having found that he had a cancerous tumor pressing against his liver, participated religiously in a prayer group that met weekly and as himself one of several people in our church who laid hands on those in the need of prayer after Sunday morning services. He both gave and received an enormous amount of prayer, as well as basking in the friendship and compassion of the dozen others who were part of the prayer group. Nevertheless, he died as a result of his cancer. All of us, I'm afraid, have many stories in our lives like the one about Marty. Here's one more from my own experience. Before I was ordained, I served as a Eucharistic visitor at a California church, bringing communion to folks shut in and unable as a consequence to get the services. One of those I visited every couple of weeks was a relatively young woman in her early 40s who had lived in New York City where she sang opera. She had had to return to her parents' home because she suffered from that most debilitating of all diseases, ALS, that Lou Gehrig's disease. Although her body continued to fail her, her mind remained sharp. Right to the end, she had great acuity and retained a strong interest in the day's readings and in the notes that I had made about the rector's sermons. He's, by the way, now the Dean of Grace Church Cathedral in San Francisco, one of the, the real 
pearls of the Episcopal Church. She delightedly discussed those, those notes with me. But week after week, I saw her perceptibly decline between each of my visits until on my last visit, just a week and a half before her death. Giving her communion was nearly impossible because she was by then unable even to swallow voluntarily. Took a little teeny bit of the host and put it on her tongue and it kind of melted. She and her whole family prayed unceasingly for her healing. But of course, if healing means the reversal of the disease process, all those prayers were in vain. They didn't accomplish the desired result. The two stories in today's gospel are significant in their discussion of this issue of what exactly we might hope for, if not expect, about the effect of prayer on healing in today's world. It's difficult not to be just a bit skeptical, if not cynical, about the possibility that should we become as desperately or chronic chronically ill as the unfortunate woman in today's story, our faith alone could make us well. There are, of course, Christian religious denominations that do truly teach that prayer is even superior to medical science. Of course, the advancement of medical science in perhaps the last 150 years ought surely to be taken into consideration. Doctors can now cure conditions that before the understanding of disease as the result of bacteria and viruses literally had no cure whatever. But there are people who, even in today's world, resist seeing physicians. When I was still with the district attorney's office where I worked as so long, we routinely had cases come to our courtroom of children whose parents' religious beliefs opposed the medical treatment that their child appeared to need. In the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, doctors often said that a particular child needed a medical procedure that would necessitate the use of a blood transfusion. Most of those cases actually presented not much problem for two reasons. First, the the parents were, more often than not, willing for their child to receive the appropriate treatment. They simply didn't want themselves to authorize something that their own religion taught was wrong. They were happy to have the judge take that responsibility off of their back. Second, advances in hematology that have made transfusions of whole blood necessary are, now in, are necessary in far fewer cases than previously. Now, the situation of Christian scientists, though, was far more serious, since many uh, of them, and certainly their religion, opposed all medical treatment. Inasmuch as Mary Baker Eddy's teaching on the subject was that what appeared to be sickness was really illusory, the result of wrong thinking. It wasn't actually disease at all. To obtain medical treatment for something that doesn't actually exist makes no sense at all. So our judge would have to tread very carefully indeed, not ordering treatment for a Christian science child, for example, too young to make an informed decision of his own until the medical condition was one from which the doctors assured the court that the child simply had no chance of recovering without the court's intervention. But there were times that the court, so that, that there were times the, the court simply had to intervene and so it did. There are other churches that believe in healing through prayer, of course, some of which take just a stronger position against the use of medical science. They often rely instead on the words found in the letter of James, that those who are sick should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of, of Jesus. Well, in the wor world of the woman depicted in today's gospel, a world of rather limited medical uh, knowledge and technology, St. James's advice probably made at least as much sense for most conditions as visiting a doctor would make. But today, at least in the, in the, the first world, I, I rather like the phrase, so hallowed in American naval history, since I think metaphorically it applies equally well in this sort of situation. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition.
The brains that acquire medical skills are also gifts from God. We can surely pray, but ought not to do so in, to the exclusion of the best medical care that we can find. I only wish that in cases like Anne's, the medical knowledge had advanced just a bit further. There's, of course, no doubt that there is, for many conditions, a strong mind-body connection. We can, through prayer or meditation, and especially through faith, dramatically improve our well-being, whether we receive an actual cure for our malady or not. In today's story, Jesus tells the woman to take heart that her faith has made her well. But in his recitation of that conversation, Matthew uses for the concept to make well the verb sozo, which word also means to save. That he uses that word must have had a resonance for his audience that the story is about both healing and salvation. We can benefit from the relationship between the two concepts. When we trade all the distractions of our daily lives for a closer relationship with God, we shall have both salvation and a greater overall health as well, no matter what our specific physical condition may be. And that's true no matter whether we are physically healed or not. We have all known people whose lives are, have, are lived with great difficulty whether from arthritis or loss of limb or blindness or some other debilitating condition, but who are models of sanity, cheerfulness, and equanimity. I have no doubt that just like the woman with the 12 years of hemorrhage, who can now return to society from which she had previously been excluded as being unclean, folks who are not physically healed but continue to have faith can receive their healing as the salvation for which we all yearn. So may such faith heal us all. Please turn to page 96 for Apostles' Creed. Page 96. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and seated to the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn 772, hymn 772, the insert.
Please be seated. Do we have any announcements, any birthdays? Any announcements? Anything? No? Please turn to page 97 for the Lord's Prayer. Page 97. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us into not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Colic for Sundays, O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through, your, through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Christ our Lord. Amen. Colic of the day, O oh God, from all good proceeds, grant that your inspiration, we may think those things that are right and by your merciful guiding may do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Prayers of the people, please turn to page 388, page 388, form 4. Let us pray for the world, for the, let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, 
We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Colic for priests. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Page 101, we're on page 101. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. General Thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness us to all whom you made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, your invisible love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercy that we truly thankful hearts, we may show your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness of all days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom we do on the of Spirit, be honor and glory to you forever, ever. Amen. Page 102, the prayer to St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, You've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you and you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. St. Richard's Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, help us in this day and every day to see the more clearly, to follow thee more nearly, to love thee more clearly. A name from the Amen. Final hymn is hymn 390, all verses, 390.
Thanks be to God.